Hello, welcome to the program. I'm so glad that you decided to join me today. Today I want to talk to you about worship, the priority of worship. We have to understand that as Christians, our highest calling is that of worshipers. Intimacy with God, putting Him first, ministering to the Lord. And it's not just limited to worship in the sense of just singing, you know, slow songs in a church service. Yes, that's a part of it. Absolutely. That's a, a, a wonderful um, uh, attribute of worship. But that's, it's not just limited to that. I'm talking about your personal time with the Lord, personal worship, as the Bible says, in spirit and in truth. And it's to be a priority, not just something that you do, you know, just like, well, you know, today I don't feel like being a worshiper, so I'll just, you know, save that for Sunday. No, this is a lifestyle. We're to have a lifestyle of being a worshiper, a worshiper of God, something that we do all the time to have that wonderful one-on-one -on -one communion with God, the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, to have that, that, that intimate time that we have set aside to bask in his presence. Even without asking anything, yes, the prayer petition is a wonderful prayer, but that is, a lot of people just, you know, pray the prayer petition, but they forget about the prayer of worship, where we're not asking for anything, we're just coming to honor him, to minister to him, to love him, to love him, to know him more, not just about, so a lot of people know about God, but they don't know him personally, they don't know him intimately, and that's what he desires, that we would give him our, our, our whole heart, that we would be worshipers in truth and spirit, that we, we would come into that time. Where we just, you know, you may be singing songs to him in your private time. Yes, corporate worship is is, is is needed too. But I'm talking about just when you're coming, just that one-on-one -on -one with him. Where you are dwelling in that pure, that holy, supernatural intimacy with him. Dwelling in his presence. Honoring him. Adoring him. Thirsting after his presence. And that's supposed to be a priority. We need to establish the priority of first things first. God and his word are the most important things. You know, that, that, that time of worship and intimacy and being in his word, those are the most important things of life of a Christian. But so many get caught up in doing things for God that they forget about worshiping God. They forget about ministering to him because they're doing so many things for him. And those things in and of themselves are not wrong. But if we are neglecting our time and spending in the secret place, the secret place of his presence, as in Psalm 91, we're to dwell in not just you know, uh, have a visitation. He's not looking, God's not looking for a visitation. He's looking for a habitation. You're, you dwell there. This is who you are, not just on Sundays and Wednesdays, but every day, 365 days a year, seven days a week, 24 hours a day. And we need to really get this in the forefront of our thinking. Worship is to be the lifestyle and the priority of the, of the Christian. That is our highest calling, to love Jesus, to know him intimately, to soak in his presence. In Luke, Chapter 10, 38 and 42, you see the story of two sisters, Mary and Martha of Bethany. It says, now it happened as they went that he, talking about Jesus, Jesus entered a certain village and a certain woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary who also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. But Martha was distracted with much serving and she approached him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Therefore, tell her to help me. And Jesus answered and said to her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and troubled about many things. But one thing is needed. And Mary has chosen that good part, which will not be taken away from her. Now, notice we see, like I said, these two sisters, Mary and Martha of Bethany. Now, Martha was one of these people who was just always busy. She was a worry boy. She was running to and fro, doing so many things that, you know, she got distracted. Her sister Mary, though, was a worshiper. In fact, every time we see Mary of Bethany in Scripture, she's always at the feet of Jesus. She was the one who broke open that costly um, alabaster box of precious ointment and anointed him for his burial. And he and, and she uh, uh, wiped his, his feet with her hair. She didn't care what people thought. She was in the presence of the king, Jesus, and she was a worshiper. She listened to him. She soaked in his presence. But notice that Martha was distracted, was much serving. And then she got mad, like it always happens when somebody is truly serving God and the person who's going around, you know, so busy, busy, they, they get mad at the person who's doing the right thing. And she said, Lord, don't you even care that my sister has, has left me to serve a mom? Tell her to help me. But Martin, uh, Jesus had to rebuke 
Martha. He had real grief. He said, Martha, Martha, you are worried and troubled about many things. See, there was the, the problem. It wasn't that really, you know, her being busy and doing things. It was that she had her priorities mixed up. She didn't put first things first. And that was Jesus. He was here in their midst. He was one their attention. Mary gave Jesus the attention. She sat at his feet and heard his word. She was a worshiper. She was listening. She had on her listening ears. But Martha was busy. And he told her, you know what? You are worried and troubled about many things. But one thing is needed. And Mary has chosen that good part, which will not be taken away from her. Mary chose the good part. What did she choose? The priority of first things first. She chose to sit at his feet, to hear his word, to worship him, to listen to him, to minister to him, to let him speak unto her. And that's what you have to try and get into Martha's thick skull. One thing is needed. And that one thing is that true intimacy, that true time in God's presence, to be a true worshiper. And that's what I encourage each one of you who are watching this teaching, that you would, your hearts would be totally just changed from that, you know, hard, stony heart into a heart of flesh that, you know, you're, you're tender towards the Lord and his commandments. You're tender in that sense that you are just allowing him to speak to you and that you quiet yourself and listen to him. Put away all the distractions. In Matthew 6, 33, Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. That means his way of doing and being right. Then all the things you need to get done will be accomplished. But don't seek all the things. No, seek God. Seek him. Seek his word. Seek his presence. Then all the things you need to get done, they'll come in their proper order. But they're not to be before God. God is to be first. We have to establish priorities. God needs to be first in your life. Spending time in his presence, in worship and intimacy, and spending time in, in his word. Those are the two most important things that we are to be involved in as believers. Yes, there are other things that we do for God. And I'm not saying those things are, are, are not necessary, but they're not to be first place. First place has to be mission too. I see a lot of people, they're so busy trying to do things for God and minister to other people, they never spend time in God's presence. So they're not going to be effective in doing those other things. Because if you don't have that alone time with God, worshiping him, in true prayer and, and uh, communion and fellowship and, and knowing him intimately, you won't be able to successfully do all the other things because it's the Lord that's going to help you. He's going to be the one that causes you to be able to be successful in the other things. That's why we need to be in God's presence, to love him, to honor him. See, this is what we really need to get into the forefront of our thinking. In John 4, 23 and 24, Jesus said, but the hour is coming, and now is, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. So you have to be spirit and truth. You know, and not going through the motions. Jesus said in Matthew, you know, talking about the prophecy that Isaiah prophesied, he said, well, did Isaiah prophesy these people? Who say, you know, who who uh, who I draw near me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Means they go through the the, uh, the motions of being a true Christian. They go through the motion <coughs> me, of being a worshiper, but their hearts are far from Him. They 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 have all these other things on their uh, agenda, and God is far down on the list. Well, this is not to be so. He said that the true worshippers are those who are the ones that the Father is seeking to worship Him. It says that God is spirit and those who worship him have to worship in spirit and truth. You know, if it's not in spirit and truth, then it's not true worship. See, so, you know, we have to come back to that place where it's all about Jesus. It's not about us. It's not about anything or anyone. It's about him, that true relationship. We are to be lovers of God, to be those who adore him, who soak in his presence. We can't get enough. We want to, you know, be in his presence all the time. And that's, and we can be. Like, you, you may say, well, I can't just, you know, because we sit in a secret place and I got to do the other things. Even when you're on your job working, you can still be singing melodies and songs in your heart unto the Lord. When you're in the shower, when you're in the grocery store. See, there's no end to this. We are to have a lifestyle of being in his presence, being worshipers. That's the highest calling that we have. And we can grow, as we talked about before, we can grow in deeper levels of intimacy. We can grow in those deeper glory realms. If we would take the time to spend in his presence, and to allow him to speak to our heart, to allow him to 
show forth what he wants to accomplish, what he wants to do in our lives, corporately and individually. See, we can have divine encounters with God, but you're going to have to set aside all these other things that crowd out your time with him so that you can listen to and hear his voice clearly. The Holy Spirit is our inward witness, our inward voice, and he wants to speak to each one of us. But are your listening ears open? Are you going to, you know, quiet yourself so you can hear him? And then speak to him, and then when he speaks to you, then to answer him, to love him, to worship him. See, we need to get this in spirit and in truth. In Psalms 26, 8, it says, Lord, I have loved the habitation of your house and the place where your glory dwells. See, that, just like the psalmist, that needs to be our heart attitude. Lord, I have loved the habitation of your house. Well, if you don't spend time habitating in his house, that means in his presence, then how are you going to have this, this, um, uh, this, you know, this conversation? How are you going to have this as your de declaration, as well as say, as your declaration? Lord, I have love. Why? Because he spent time in his presence. Think about it. David spent time in the presence of the Lord. He was a worshiper. And we, just like David, we need to be worshipers of God. Not just people who are always just praying, gimme, 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 my name is Jimmy. And just the only time we thank God or come before him is just maybe say grace over a meal or just when we're in a corporate setting. No, this is a personal relationship. We don't have a religion. Jesus Christ is a relationship. And we should want to not just, oh, you know, as a, if you're a dredging thing, then you don't even need to bother because God's not looking for people who are just doing it as, you know, like they feel like they have to do it. It's because we get to, we want to, we love him. We are hungry for more of him. We want to be in his presence. We want to be in that intimacy with him. doesn't matter if it's 30 minutes, an hour, two hours, five hours. Guess what? You're not thinking about in natural time. Because when you're in his presence, you know what? Forget about time. He's looking for that quality time in the presence of the Lord. We're not thinking about anything else. It's all about him. It says, Lord, I have loved the habitation of your house and the place where your glory dwells. His glory is right there in his presence. And you can experience his glory. That we as believers are to be carriers of God's glory. That anointing of his needs to be so fresh upon us that when people see us, they see him living within us. And that will draw those people unto him. See, we need to be living carriers of God's glory. And it's only going to happen if we spend time in his presence. If we make our habitation in the secret place. The priority of worship. Think about it. And then in Psalms 27, 4 through 8. It says, look what David said. He said, one thing. There's that one thing again. Remember what, what uh, Jesus told Martha? You know, Mary chose the one thing that is needed. The one thing. And that's what I uh, encourage you to choose. One thing I've desired of the Lord, that will I see. That I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. To behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. And that needs to be a heart desire. That we will dwell in his house. All the days of our life. To behold the beauty of the Lord. To inquire in his temple. To, to gaze into his loveliness. To worship him in his holiness. See, that's awesome. And that's what the Lord wants and requires from each one of us as Christians. He says, for in the time of trouble, he shall hide me in his pavilion. In the secret place of his tabernacle, he shall hide me. And he shall set me high upon a rock. And now my head shall be lifted up above my enemies all around me. Therefore, I'll offer sacrifices of joy in this tabernacle. I will sing. Yes, I will sing praises to the Lord. See, praise and worship go hand in hand. We praise God means for what he's done, and we worship him for who he is. Hear, O Lord, when I cry with my voice. Have mercy also upon me and answer me. When you said, seek my face, my heart said to you, your face, Lord, I will seek. That needs to be our declaration. That when, when God says, seek my face, our heart immediately says, Lord, your face I will seek. See, that's true worship. That's true intimacy. That's knowing him deeper and deeper in that and those levels of intimacy that you didn't even know existed, but they do. But you're going to have to spend time in his presence, in the secret place. You're going to have to make the priority of worship. Set aside those other things. They can go happen in their proper time and put God first. Learn to hear his voice, to worship him, to uplift his name. Yes, in song, that's but also just maybe just sp spending quiet time in his presence with your hands lifted up to him. 
your heart lifted up to him. See, there's many aspects in, in them, uh, you know, ways that we can worship God. It's, it's not even about the ways, it's is your heart right? Are you going to make the time to spend in his presence? Is that a top priority? If it's not, it needs to be. If it's not top priority, you need to repent. And repentance is not a bad word. Like I always say, repentance is the lifestyle of the believer. Repent of being in a lukewarm state. Repent of being in a, a state where you put everything else first above God. Well, guess what? That's idolatry. And the Bible says to flee from idolatry. We're to put God first. He is the one. If you want to idolize someone, idolize the Lord Jesus. You can idolize him because he is everything. But everything else needs to, well, anything that's, that's contrary to the, the word of God obviously needs to be eradicated purely. But there are other things that are not bad in themselves, but they become bad in the sense that if you put them before God, then they become idols. And then that's when the problem exists. That's why we have to make sure everything is in its proper order. But intimacy with the Lord and spending time in his word are the two most important things. That's what we have to put first place. In Psalms 42, 1 through 3, As the deer pants for the water brooks, so pants my soul for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? My tears have been my food day and night, while they continually say to me, Where is your God? So we have to have this kind of, this, this attitude. You know what, that, what, where are you, Lord God? Because I can't live another day without you. I'm lost without you. I'm desperate for you. You are the air I breathe, like that song. He is our daily bread. You know, we, we can't go another moment without him. We need him daily. And we need to be like, just like picture a, a deer in the natural realm. When they're panting and thirsting for the water. Think about it. That needs to be our heart's cry. Where we're thirsting him. Just like if you're out, out in, a, uh, in a desert area and it's, it's dry and you're thirsty, you know, and, and uh, all you can think about is water. Well, guess what? Jesus is the living water and we need to thirst about him. Only he can satisfy. He's the living water. He's the daily bread. And we need this to um, uh, thirst for him. We need to long to be in his presence. And after you've been in his presence, you say, Lord, I can't wait for the next time to be in your presence because you're everything to me. See, we need to have this kind of mindset. Think about it. In Psalms 105, or excuse me, 95, and then we'll look at 105. In 95, 6 and 7, it says, Oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker. For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Think about it. And then it goes on to say, Today, if you will hear his voice, in the first part of eight, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. So a lot of people harden their hearts, and they don't want to hear his voice. They just want, you know, God to do all these things for him, to, to, um, uh, to just do everything that's on their laundry list, and then they forget about just worshiping him for who he is. Well, that's not true worship. That's not anything. And that just goes back to what Isaiah prophesied. You know what, Lord, you know, what all these people, they honor me with their lips. It means they, they, they give lip service, but their hearts are far from me. It goes on to say that they teach um, uh, the commandments of men as doctrines. Well, we're not to be immersed in the commandments of men. We're to be immersed in, immersed in the commandments of the Lord God. And, and he has commanded us to be strong and courageous. He has commanded us to be obedient. He has commanded us to love him, as we're going to see in another scripture in a few minutes, with all our hearts, all our minds, all our strength. Those are commandments of the New Testament. It says, come, let us worship and bow down and kneel before the Lord our maker. Like I said, there's many aspects of worshiping. You can be, you can be standing or kneeling, bowing down um, uh, with your hands lifted up. And it's not, it, it doesn't matter what way you do it as long as you make the priority of doing it. Think about it. We have to, we are the people of his pasture with the sheep of his hand. He's the good shepherd. And the good shepherd wants to lead you and guide you. As you know, it says in Psalm 23, through those wonderful still that place of still waters, those restful waters, which is his presence. Think about it. Another psalm, it says that we can drink from the river of his pleasure because in his light, we see light. This is Psalms 36. So we really need to know that worship is not just something that is, you know, well, if you want to, just like, you know, oh, you can choose. No, it's a priority. It's the lifestyle of the believer, that intimate worship we have with the Lord because we are one with him. As his body, bone of his bone and flesh of his flesh. And he wants us to have that 
true deep intimacy with him as born again believers. In Psalms 105, 1 through 4, the word says, Oh, give thanks to the Lord, call upon his name, make known his deeds among the peoples. Sing to him, sing psalms to him, talk of all his wondrous works. Glory in his holy name, and let the hearts of those rejoice who seek the Lord. Seek the Lord and his strength, seek his face evermore. Think about it. We are to talk of all his wondrous works. To say, yes, Lord God, thank you for who you are. You are what worthy. You are holy. You are mighty. You're my savior, my healer, my provider, my deliverer, my fortress, everything. Think about it. But we are to seek him. You know, like that. I know it's a, it's a cliche, you know, when people, you know, people say, well, seek his face and not his hand. But it's true. We are to seek his face. But it's not wrong to seek him for, for, for provision for things you need, but that's not to be your top priority, not, and then, then just forget about him altogether. No, our first priority is to seek his face, just to worship him, to love him, to tell him how wonderful he is, to abide in his presence, to honor him, you know, to just wait still in his presence. Think about it. It says, seek the Lord and his strength. Seek his face evermore. It's not just, you know, well, once in a while or when you need something. No, seek his face all the time because he's desiring and longing for you to commune with him. And that's just, you know, the truth. We are to be those who have fellowship with God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We serve a triune God. And we are to have that time of intimacy, seeking his face, seeking his strength. Because in the flesh, we're weak. And we, the way we get strength is also by seeking him. And we can draw from his strength. And that gives us strength. In uh, Philippians Chapter 3, verse 3. It says, For we are the circumcision who worship God in the Spirit, rejoice in Christ Jesus, and have no confidence in the flesh. Think about it. Let me read that again. It says, We are the circumcision who worship God in the Spirit. Remember? We worship in spirit and in truth. We rejoice in Christ Jesus. And have no confidence in the flesh. See, a lot of people, they, they're so confident in their own flesh, their own ability to do and say and things. And they just put, you know, they just sweep God under the rug. Well, no, our, we can't have confidence in the flesh. The flesh is weak. The flesh, you know, wants to do what it wants to do. The enemy can operate through the flesh realm. And that's why we have to say, no, we can have no confidence in the flesh. Our confidence is in God. Our confidence is being in that place where we are in that um, uh, intimacy with him. We're in that glory realm. And we can grow, as the Bible says, from glory to glory, from faith to faith. We are to build the layers of this truth on the inside of us. And when we do, that's what's going to come out of our mouths in faith. Like I said, the most important things, I, I can't say this enough, is intimacy with the Lord and being one who is in his word on a daily basis. And guess what? When you do that, guess what? Then all the things that you need to accomplish in your life, in your personal life, in your ministry, whatever, those things will come together and they'll happen the way they need to happen. But if you do everything and leave God out of the equation, then guess what? Then your life's going to be in turmoil because that's just the plain honest truth. We need to be worshipers. And don't think of it as just like a drudgery. Oh, you know, I have to take this time off to go in, in my prayer closet or wherever I go to worship and I have to sit there and I don't know what to say and oh it's, it's boring. No. If you have that attitude then yeah it will be. But you need to have the attitude I get to come into the Lord's presence. I get to spend time with the kingdom king from the Lord. Guess what? It's not boring. It's exciting. I can't tell you how wonderful it is to be in his presence. To soak in his presence. To lift your hands up to him. To worship him. To adore him. Like I said in the world, people want to get drunk on alcohol. But that's what, as Christians, we don't do that. Well, if we have any sense. There are some that do that, and that's a whole other story. Don't get me started on that. But as true Christians, true born and Christian Christians, who are connected to this word of God, guess what? We get drunk in the spirit, in the Holy Spirit. We are inebriated on the power of being in his presence, soaking in his glory, worshiping him, honoring him, loving him, knowing him more. See, that is, is awesome. And each one of as believers can experience that. But you're going to have to be determined to not let things crowd out your time of the Lord, not to let things hinder. We need to 
remove all the hindrances out of our lives so that we can have that time with the Lord, so that we can be those who worship in the Spirit, who rejoice in Christ Jesus, and have no confidence in the flesh. We have to discipline our flesh, because the flesh doesn't want to pray. The flesh doesn't want to read the Word. The flesh doesn't want to soak in God's presence. That's when you say, flesh, you're going to line up with the Word of God. Discipline your flesh and bring it into subjection to the will of God, which is God's Word. God's Word and His will are one and the same. In Matthew 22, I mentioned this earlier, Matthew 22, 37 through 40, and Jesus said to him, talking about, you know, if you read earlier, they were saying, what's the greatest commandment? And Jesus said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Jesus is saying, you know what? This is the greatest commandment. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. See, God's looking for those who truly love him. You know what? Jesus is not looking for uh, a part-time lover. He wants, a, he wants your full attention, undivided attention. It's not time for part-time lovers. No, this is time for those who are truly connected to him. This is a, a supernatural divine intimacy that we have with the Lord, a pure and holy relationship that we have with our precious Lord. And he desires that we love him with all, think about it, notice it's with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. Not just part of your heart, not just part of your soul, not just part of your mind, all of it. Remember, again, in John 4 and Philippians 3, those who worship God are worshiping him in the spirit, and we worship him in truth. And it always has to come back to that, not just, you know, where you're, you know, uh, whether you're in a corporate setting or in a personal setting, just, you know, your eyes closed or, or open or whatever, your hands lift up. But in, in your thoughts and in your heart, you're thinking about, you know, what you're going to have for dinner, what you're going to have for lunch, what you're going to do next month, next week. Guess what? You need to bind those things, cast those thoughts down and bring them captive and get all that out of your, your thinking and just concentrate on him. Allow the Lord to speak to your heart. Just let and, and also praying in tongues is, is important too, you know, as praying in the spirit. I encourage people to pray more in, in, in the spirit, even during your regular prayer times and in your times of worship. Worship in the spirit. But the key is we have to do it in spirit and in truth. And we have to do it with all our hearts, all our mind, all our strength. Guess what? That's the greatest thing that the Lord's asking. He wants that intimacy. And um, uh, if we don't come into that place, then guess what? Then we're going to well, we're, 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 we're hurting the Lord because that's what he desires from us. But we're also hurting ourselves because we're not having that time to love him. Think about it. In First Chronicles 29, First Chronicles 29, 10 through 13. And now in this one, we see him, uh, a lot about praise, but this also goes together with worship because... Even though we praise God for what he's done, we worship him for who he is. But when you mix those two together, guess what? You have a, an awesome combination of what we as believers are called to do. It says, therefore, David blessed the Lord before all the assembly. Let me stop there. Before all the assembly. It means he wasn't ashamed. He didn't just try to do it in secret. He wasn't ashamed of the Lord. And neither should we. It says, before, he blessed the Lord before all the assembly. And David said, blessed are you, Lord God of Israel, our father. Forever and ever. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness, the power and the glory, the victory and the majesty. For all that is in heaven and in earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord, and you are exalted as head over all. Both riches and honor come from you, and you reign over all. In your hand is power and might. In your hand it is to make great and to give strength to all. Now, therefore, our God, we thank you and praise your glorious name. See, that is a, a, a wonderful declaration of praise, of worship, of ascribing to the Lord all that he is. Not all that he, all he's done, yes, but all that he is also. Think about it. He says, yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory, the victory and the majesty. Yours is the kingdom. You're exalted as head over all. 
riches and honor that come from you. You reign over all. In your hand is power, look at this, and might to make great, to give strength. And then he goes on to say that we praise you and thank you, your glorious name. See, those are things that we can also say in our times of prayer, in our times of coming before him in his presence, to worship him, to minister to him, to honor him. So we really need to ex take an examination of our lives to see, are we really true worshipers? Are we those who just come before God with a prayer of petition? We set our needs before him, and then we leave and we never just lift up his name in worship. If that is you, then you need to repent of that before today and come into that place where that you make sure that you have equal times. In fact, I'll, I'll, I'll say I'll go as far as to say this: the worship should should outweigh the petition. It really should. Your worship and praise and ministering Him should outweigh the petition. It shouldn't be the other way around. You know, more petition than there is worship. No, there should be more worship unto Him than there is petition. But yes, we already have petition. But that's not to be your just goal of it. But so many people, that's their goal, even if they even do that. Lots. There's some people who claim to be Christians and they don't, and then their lives have just no connection with God other than what them saying a sinner's prayer 40 years ago or whatever. Well, we need to get, you know, our lives in order and to make sure that we are examining our lives and saying, you know what, is my life, is my priorities in order? Have I established the the priority of first things first. Am I a Mary of Bethany or am I a Martha? If you're a Martha, then you need to turn your life around and come into that place where you're a Mary, one who sits at the feet of Jesus. You listen to his word. You worship him. You honor him. And you don't care about the opinions of man. You don't care about what people will think of you. All you care about is what God thinks of you, of being a worshiper of him, being one that, that comes before his presence. And wants to be changed by him. Because it, when we're in his presence, we're going to be changed. We need to allow. And I say this when I come to his presence. Lord, you know, place me on your potter's will. Shape me and mold me into a vessel that's fit for your service. Remove, let your holy fire remove the chaff. Remove the dross. And empower your righteousness and holiness within me. And then we uplift our, his name. Uplift his name. Worship him. Ascribe strength and honor to him. Glorify him. Love him more. Every day. We should grow deeper. The Bible says deep calls unto deep. And we are to desire to grow into the deeper things of God. Desire, you know, uh, spending time in his presence and having divine encounters. And you will. But you're going to have to make sure that you put the Lord first. Again, the priority of first things first. And then in Matthew 6.33, I mentioned it earlier, but I just want to read it to you. From the word, Matthew 6.33 Jesus said, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. There's a lot of things that people want, and it's not bad, you know, to have things themselves, but it's when things have you, that's when the problem occurs, you know, even if they're good things. Because the best thing, the one thing, as we talked about earlier, the one thing that is needed, the one thing that we should desire is him, the Lord. Spending time in his presence, soaking in his presence, true intimacy with him, loving, loving Jesus. <coughs> Excuse me. So really, just take this seriously. Because there's nothing more important than spending time in the, in the, Lord, in the Lord's presence and in his word. So again, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. When you seek him, his face, his presence, all that pertains to him and his kingdom. Guess what? And everything you have need of will fall into its proper place. Again, we need to make sure that we are prioritizing the things in our life and that God and his word, his presence, need to be the very top on the list. And when it is, guess what? Your life will change. You'll see so, so much difference. You'll be like, wow, why didn't I do this sooner? So really, really think about this and take it seriously. And Make sure your life is lined up with God's word. Make sure you are a worshiper, one who worships the Lord with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your strength. And when you do, guess what? You'll be well on your way to victory. To really, really take this seriously. And remember, Isaiah 40, verse 8. The word of God stands forever. Amen.